Hello, I'm Dawn Durham, and welcome to Patent Pod. Today we're talking about increasing graduation rates. Many practitioners, and families too, think about graduation when a child enters um, high school, so like ninth, 10th grade. But that's kind of a myth. In reality, we really should be thinking about graduation when a student enters kindergarten, and it's something we should be thinking about all the way through up until every child walks across that stage to receive his or her diploma. Joining me today are three patent consultants to help us understand how do we increase graduation rates for all students. Dr. Laura Moran, Diane Funston, and Mike Miner is joining us via Zoom from the West. Thank you all of you for being here. We appreciate that you're taking your time to talk with us um, and share your knowledge and insights about how do we help all student populations to walk across that stage and receive the diploma that's so well deserved. I want to start out by um, taking a look at a document that I know we've seen numerous times. And it's called the ABCs of graduation. Mm -hmm. Help me understand and help our, our listeners understand what are the ABCs and how does that apply to graduating high school? Right, and sometimes when we think of the ABCs, we think of the alphabet, but it's great because Dr. Robert Belfont from John Hopkins University has done a lot of research around what are some indicators to say, you know what, this child or this student may be off track for graduation. And after looking at numerous documents and indicators, he found three that were significant, and we titled them the ABCs. So A stands for attendance. And attendance being, if you have a student who misses at least two months or two days a month of school, they can be at risk of dropping out. The other thing is behavior. And we look at behavior as school code of conduct as well as state reportable offenses. So for those major things, but also looking at those students who may have office discipline referrals or who may be sent for different reasons around behavior. And then the C stands for course performance, and particularly we're looking at the areas of English language arts, your grade there, and your grade in mathematics. So when we take a look at this, we put it all together, if you have a student who is off track in the area of attendance or behavior or course performance, they have a 75% chance of dropping out. And we found this even as early as kindergarten, as you were saying. Some of this research started in middle school, where we started in sixth grade, and then it's prevalent more in high schools. But actually, we're finding even earlier mm -hmm. that if you have a student who's off track, they can be even at risk at an early age. So I just want to make sure I understand, because that, that number is staggering mm -hmm. to me. So you're saying if any student, kindergarten through 12th grade, has some kind of inconsistencies with our attendance, our behavior, and our course performance, something that would be a red flag, they are 75% likely to not finish high school. That's right. I mean, that's, yes. that, that in itself is just a staggering yeah. number to think about. And we think about just everyday life that occurs. We say, oh, it's no big deal. You missed a day here. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't worry. You didn't do so well here. Oh, you got sent home from the office. No big deal. But that, I mean, just two absences a month, month. really yes. picks up your your likelihood to, to not succeed mm -hmm. at, with a high school scary. diploma. That is very scary. Yeah. I want to talk specifically about that attendance. Now, obviously, you have to be in school to learn. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you alluded to this a little bit, Laura, in regards to attendance. But help me understand more specifically, how does being in school impact from kindergarten through 12th grade the likelihood of me graduating? And I want to talk about it both in traditional brick and mortar schools, but also how that looks in a cyber school. Because because we have more and more kiddos across the Commonwealth in cyber academies, it's got to have an impact on them as well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, research is telling us that one of the number one factors that leads to better student achievement is student engagement. And how do kids get engaged? Well, they have to be in school, at least to have the opportunity to be engaged. Mm -hmm. um, attendance is, is really vital, and it goes back, as you guys have already said, all the way back to kindergarten. Um, we've been using Robert Belfans's research in the work that we've been doing, and that has that whole notion of knowing the likelihood that somebody may drop out is. We keep saying to people, you need to know that that kind of thing is happening. And uh, one of the metrics that we've been following, of course, is something called chronic absence. Chronic absence, which is defined as students missing 10 or more, 10 percent or more of the school of school days, um, given for any reason, excused absences unexcused absences yeah. and days of suspension. So the fact that you have a note from your mom doesn't mean that you're now in school. And so that's just really important. And knowing that and keeping track of that 
um, helps us deal with students in kindergarten and third grade who are not able to read, mm -hmm. and middle school students who are failing subjects, and high school kids who may be dropping out of school. And I think the whole notion of cyber schools just lends itself to even greater difficulties. Um, typically in a brick and mortar school, kids come to school or they don't come to school, they're absent, they're, they're in attendance or they're not. Um, it's pretty clear cut, but in cyber schools, they can really set their own attendance policies. Mm -hmm. And it looks very different across different schools. So in some schools, it may be that you have to submit a certain a number of assignments in a week or in a cycle, mm -hmm. and then you're considered to be in attendance. Um, in other schools, a cert, uh, assignments may be worth a certain number of points, and that contributes to your grade. But in some schools, it's just a matter of logging in. And anybody yeah. really can be logging in, and then you can walk away from your desk or from your computer the rest of the day. So there is nothing um, in Pennsylvania law or regulations that requires a, a consistent um, definition of attendance in cyber schools. <laughs> My understanding is that the only thing that the uh, administrator has to do is to report at the end of the year that they have followed their policy. So that that sense of engagement, that sense of relationship is really very different in a cyber setting and it's really hard on both the students and the staff. I want to circle back to two things you had said. You had said that even though there might be a time when we have excused absences, that's still being absent from school. Right. I know as a parent myself, I think, well, I have a doctor's note, it's okay, it's yeah. excused, but in fact, they are out of the learning environment right. Right. that many more times, and we're, we're increasing our likelihood of not walking across that stage to right. get our diploma. And I don't, I don't think, I mean, I know I haven't thought about it, but that's something that I think not just yeah. instructional leaders and practitioners, but families need to be thinking about yeah. as well. Yeah, and you're right. When you think about 10% of the days, that's two days a month. Mm -hmm. Right. So how many people like know a lot, kids but it really know, is. Uh, yeah, are out of school two days yeah. a month. It's really pretty common. Yeah. The other thing that can get hidden in this is that schools may have a 90% overall attendance rate. Right. So you think, oh, we're doing great. 90% of our students are here on a daily basis, but actually, really look at those 10% of students who are missing because probably they're your chronic students who then become off track. And so sometimes and uh, it looks like a very great attendance rate overall, but we really need to dig down deeper. Who are those students who are absent and who are in that 10% and find out why, even if it is an excused absent or not, why are they missing school? Yeah. You had talked about um, <coughs> cyber schools and how it offers another layer of a challenge, being that there's no specific law in our state that says uh, regarding attendance on a, on a cyber school or cyber academy. Um, I want to I want to bring that back up when we talk about the stakeholders in this game. I want to talk about that when we talk about our families yeah. and our parents. So yeah. uh, let's make sure we do that. Mike, I want to get you in here on this conversation. <coughs> talk to me about behavior. Is it just following the rules and being respectful and mindful of, of what's going on around <coughs> us, or is there something more about behavior that impacts our likelihood to graduate high school. All right, thank you. Um, definitely more than that, behavior is linked to attendance and course performance as we've been talking about. Missing too much school, which can start at a very young age, is a behavior that's gonna impact the student's performance and will alter that trajectory to be on, on track to graduate. I think typically when we think about behavior, we think of externalizing and internalizing behaviors. But we're also talking about things such as disengagement, missing assignments, being off task, not being prepared, um, and, and not approving those credits that are gonna get them moving in the direction of graduation. Uh, we collect a lot of behavioral data. We collect office discipline referrals, suspension data, in school, out of school suspension, detention data, uh, even visits to the nurses. Those are all data that you wanna take into consideration and then systemically use that data to inform decisions to for the betterment of the larger school, but as well as the individual students that need support. And one improvement strategy that we have seen in many schools across the Commonwealth is the implementation of positive behavior interventions and supports. PBIS will provide a framework uh, where you teach, model, practice, and reinforce behavior to all students. And you know, really teaching that expected behavior across multiple settings is a first step to support students and maintain that trajectory. Some students might need additional layers of intervention and two specific interventions that we've been working with are Check and Connect and Renew. Uh, Check and Connect is being implemented in a handful of schools across the state where you develop a mentoring relationship between a mentor and a student. Uh, you're building relationships, you're using this ABC data 
That's the check part is checking the student's data and then connecting that student to a personalized intervention specific to what he or she needs with the goal of school completion and then developing those academic and social competencies they'll need in their post-secondary life. Renew is another one that's another individualized intervention that is specific. It's about student empowerment and it's students going to a person-centered planning map where they get to better know themselves, we get to better know their, mm. the student, and then he or she develops an individualized team and you put that plan in place. So check and connect and renew uh, they fall within the PBIS framework, but those are examples of interventions that are out there that can, can support students across the grade span. So when you talk about behavior, and I want to I just mention this, it's not necessarily behavior as in following the school rules, but it's overall the behavior in which you, you put out there. Your, um, the way in which you go about your coursework, the way in which you're getting to school, the way in which you're, you're building up your ability to kind of self-regulate and monitor yourself. It's, it's what you do, necessarily not the traditional sense of how we think about behavior is, oh, this kid's you know, out of his seat a lot or calls out in class. Not so much that traditional definition of behavior, but the, what you do in, in, in and around your school day that really impacts your course performance as well as your attendance and your engagement, as mm -hmm. we have said, is a key mm -hmm. factor, the engagement in the learning process. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that, that's correct. I think so often in behavior we just focus on, on adjectives to describe what the student is doing or not doing, uh, but really from a behavioral lens, we're looking at the whole child. So we have to look at them from start to finish academically, behaviorally, and social emotionally to, to, equip them, to equip them with the skills to be successful. Yeah. Wonderful. And this Check and Connect and this Renew, two program, two interventions that you specifically mentioned, and you said there, there are others out there. Um, where would folks, if I have instructional leaders out there who are listening, where would folks go to get information on Check and, check and Connect and Renew that could potentially be a, a source of, of resources for them? Uh, I would contact one of your local patent consultants. There's information specific to both of those interventions. Uh, we offer trainings throughout the year. Um, also, uh, specific to Renew, there are inter intermediate units that offer training. Mm -hmm. So if you reach out to your regional patent office, we can provide a lot more information on those interventions. All right, it's a great resource, and I know we don't, I don't think we put ourselves out there enough as patent consultants yeah. that, you know, regionally in the Harrisburg region and Malvern and out west where you are, Mike, is, you know, those are your go-to places, mm -hmm. and then as well as your intermediate units are, you know, your next step for getting these resources and this knowledge into the hands of the practitioners and those that need it. So I, I thank you for that. You know, in course performance, we talked about that engagement, being mm -hmm. present, right. the overall behavior of what you do to perform in the classroom. I want to pivot, though, to talk about the stakeholders in the game here. Right. There's a lot of stakeholders that we need to consider about. And Diane, I know we talked about parents and families, so let's start there. We talked about this specifically when we mentioned cyber schools and mm -hmm. cyber academy and, and the lack of specific um, rules and regulations regarding attendance on these cyber academies, but not just in cyber schools, but in the traditional brick and mortar schools, neighborhood schools. What role do parents and families mm -hmm. play in keeping kiddos on track? Well, I mean, I think, I think the role is huge of both of those, and I think that school folks need to set up opportunities for those kinds of things to happen. Um, again, with the cyber school, it, it's another layer of difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, there is not that uh, parent conferences are virtual, you know, um, IEP meetings are typically virtual. Mm -hmm. So there's that connection is not there, but it's really important to form that, to form that connection mm -hmm. for sure. And what about in, in more traditional brick and mortar schools? What's the what's the role that parents and families play there? Is it the same as if they were in whatever kind of learning environment? It doesn't matter. I think it's just being in tune to what the policies are in your school, mm -hmm. but also making sure your child is going to school. What are they doing? What's their progress like? Finding out in the high school, you know, how many credits does a student need to graduate? Do we even know that? It's amazing how we've worked in many high schools where you ask families, you ask students, how many credits do you need and what subject areas, and they're at a loss. So really sharing that information, contacting the family from the school, school side, but also the families also reaching out to the community and to the school and say, hey, I'm just checking in to see how's my daughter, how's my son doing in this area, or in attendance, making sure they're there on time. So those are things just really checking in and see how they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think student voice is such a big piece too. I mean, yeah. kids need to be part of the things that are happening with them and for them and, mm -hmm. and to them. 
Um, and as Mike mentioned, the PBIS is a great opportunity to get students involved in, in a lot of the decisions that are made around that system. That's really yeah. important. Sometimes we forget about the kids, it's but true. they're really important. That is, they are a key stakeholder. You know, we talk about the parents and the families. We talk about the practitioners and the instructional leaders. But that is, thank you for making sure that we talked about that. Yeah. The student is a, is a big um, stakeholder here and a big player in the game, and we need to make sure that their voice is heard. Right. What about instructional leaders and practitioners? What is their role? I mean, beyond the obvious, they're here, they're teaching you, mm -hmm. they're providing the environment and the learning. What's their role in ensuring that kiddos are able to succeed kindergarten on up through 12th grade, walk across mm -hmm. that stage, get Get their diploma and succeed at this life step, this milestone in life. Mm -hmm. I think for a principal or an administrator, one of the best things you can do is to allow time for teachers to meet to look at the ABC data. One of the things we hear all the time is, well, we don't have time, where do we have the time? Mm -hmm. So really saying this is a priority. We know the research is saying if we have a student or students who are off track in one or more of these areas, they're likely to not finish school. So make sure you have that time available. And what do your team meetings look like? Is it a time where we really have a structured protocol? It's a time keeper, we have a facilitator, we have a note taker, and so they're very productive times. And then anything that would be announcements wise, whether it's about a bus schedule or something coming up, maybe that could be in an email format. So for me, an administrator can really make sure that teachers have the time and opportunity to plan and meet. And it doesn't have to be long. We've set up 45-minute data team meetings that we're looking at the ABC data and then seeing and strategizing how we can help students to make sure they get the supports that they need. So as an instructional leader, being strategic about right. when you pull your staff together, so when you pull them together, it's purposeful, it's meaningful, and we're using this data, much as, as Mike had shared about the different behavioral data that we collect, going to the nurse, right. um, how many office referrals, um, you know, not being present in the classroom. Right. Those are all pieces of yeah. data that as an instructional yes. leader and as a team, we would be able to do some kind of intervention or support or scaffolding for a student who is struggling and who is red flagged right. as potentially right. not making it to that milestone at the end of 12th right. grade. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know what the research on, res on resiliency says, that for kids who are really struggling and don't have supports, that one person who's kind of a mentor for them you know, can really make the difference in the student being successful. And some of the programs that Mike mentioned, like Check and Connect and, and Project Renew, allow for that, you know, those special people to become part of the kids' lives. And so as school leaders, yeah. they need to be aware that there are mm -hmm. things like that and really encourage their, their teachers to get involved. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I know it's a bit cliche to say it takes a village, but it certainly takes quite a it town does, yeah. to get yeah. a child through this it process does. from, uh, you know, the instructional leaders, the practitioners, the IU and patent consultants mm -hmm. who are there to support what's going on in the schools, the families, um, as well as the students themselves to to reach this, this place mm -hmm. in, in life. Now, Mike, you had mentioned um, regarding where you can go and get some resources for patent, uh, at patent um, regional offices as well as the IU, but what if we're seeking more information on just how do we help a student who is red flagged? Where should we be looking at? And you know, those that are out there in the field or, or families that are listening to this are saying, well, you know, gosh, are we in any concern? Are we red flagged? What should we be doing? Where do we go to get more information? How do we help our child when we think we do have a red flag situation? I think the first step is, is having that, that communication with the school staff, with administration, with the school counselor, with teachers uh, to better understand the student level data. I think that's something we all can get better at doing is we, we collect this ABC data, but do we talk about it enough? Okay. Um, instead of waiting till the end of the school year to say uh, a student didn't earn his credit in bio, you could have had that conversation much earlier. Not waiting necessarily to the end of the nine weeks, but being up front, tracking kids, looking to see who's, who's on the watch list or whose uh, progress might look different than it did the year before. If you're well aware of that data and you're comfortable with it, we can have those discussions much earlier. Right, so it's being that, again, that bringing that yeah. purposeful time and meaningful time together to have those conversations that are going to move everyone, um, all the players, into the, the right uh, space to be able to make a, a change for in the trajectory of a student. And one of the things our schools have done is to have an early warning system so that they're collecting the ABC data in one place. Our schools are collecting data 
we have attendance data, but that might be the secretary putting that information in. We have behavior data, but that might be a, a principal or an assistant principal or dean of students. We have course performance data. That might be inputted by teachers. So it's important to have an early warning system or a database where we're collecting all of this data in one place, and then we can collect those reports, have a meeting, and then intervene, whether it's through a check mm -hmm. and connect or a mentor or renew, or they mean additional time and resources for course performance and that has really helped a lot of schools in looking at specific ABC data. So I wasn't thinking of that, but yeah, putting all the data in one place. I mean, I you know, when we, when we were back in the classroom and it's, you got to pull it from this file and then you right, got to download right. this report and then you got to go on this website and get that. That can be yeah. a bit of a hassle. And yeah. I hate to say it, but I think maybe sometimes we would say, well, we just won't look at that because it's too hard to go get that data. Right. But when it's all in one place, it's very easily accessible. And then we can really sit and mm -hmm. analyze it and, and look through that. Yeah, right. And I think another piece of that is once we have the data, we have to have the right people at the table who are looking at the data. So there have to be that combination of general educators, special educators, mm -hmm. administrators, counselors, psychologists, you know, the people who, who really are, who, who will, really will be responsible for looking at that and then moving forward with it. Yeah. yeah, one of the researchers we've had an opportunity to work with is Dr. Kathleen Lane. And one of the things she talks about is if you screen, you must intervene. So if we're collecting this ABC data, we really need to make sure, are we intervening then? Not just saying, oh, well, this student's off track in mm -hmm. attendance, or we've noticed their behavior is you know, decreasing in a certain way, or they're failing, but then what are we going to do about right. it? So not just being data rich and information poor, right. but data rich and information rich. We right. seem to sometimes get into that. We, we collect lots of data. Right. But if we don't do anything with it, what's the purpose in us collecting right. that data? So, uh, you know, yeah. again, bringing everything back to um, function over form right. is what are we doing with it and how are we looking at it and who's at the table looking mm -hmm. at it and what kind of things are we collecting mm -hmm. to make some difference yeah. in a child's trajectory yeah. and success. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate um, Laura, Diane, and Mike. Thank you for joining us via Zoom. I know that's never always uh, easy. So I do appreciate you joining us from out west. Um, you know, you've helped us, instructional leaders, practitioners, and families, and students really understand that this is a lifelong journey. Mm. This is not something we start thinking about at the end of um, high school, that this starts as soon as we put the little ones on the bus when they're five and all the way through up right. until yeah. um, 12th grade into high school. And it's something that we need to prepare for. Now, I do have a question for all three of you, and I'd like all three of your, your input on this one. We really str strive to inspire educational growth. We want practitioners in the field to be thinking about how to grow professionally. Mm -hmm. So what's your advice for those folks um, out there listening? How can they grow professionally? What would you What would you say to them? I'm going to head to you first, okay. Laura. One of the things I'd say is really try and connect with your students. I know that sounds so simple, but Learn their, learn their names, greet them at the door when they come in the morning, maybe do some focus groups, do student surveys, find out what the students are saying, what's working and not working. And particularly as an administrator, the more visible you are, the more they see you, it will just really enrich your environment, whether it's for the students, the families, and the teachers, if they can see you. So I just would say, be as visible as you can. And try and get into those classrooms as much as you can. I know that's not easy as an administrator. There's a lot of paperwork or barriers that may interfere with that, but as much as you can, connect with them as much as possible physically. So be with the students be in the visible, building. Yeah. Be there, be present, yeah. let them know who you are and that you care about their ultimate success. Yeah. Great. Good and day. I would add that, you know, we've talked about if you screen, you must intervene. Well, you need to know what it is to intervene with. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to be aware of the evidence-based practices, the high impact strategies, some of the work of John Hattie and Robert Marzano and folks like that, that have really isolated and identified high impact strategies. Um, I think to be able to share those as a staff, to have time for a professional learning community, um, to take advantage of the resources that, that are out there, like through Patton and the intermediate units, because we need to know how to move forward. In other words, just to say our kids have issues, mm -hmm. let's do something you need to know what it is to do. So that you can intervene correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, we're, right. we're, you know, we're playing dart, uh, that was that darts in the yeah. dark. Yeah. And that's, right. that's not getting that's us right. anywhere. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And Mike, what would you say to, to folks out there who are listening mm -hmm. and how to inspire them to grow professionally in the field? 
You know, one thing I talk a lot about in trainings is, you know, be comfortable and be confident with your data. Understand your data, use it instructionally, uh, programmatically, use it for staffing pur purposes, and really work on empowering each other. Uh, empower your fellow educators, leaders empowering educators, and then empower your students so that everyone knows what the goal is, what the mission is, and then continue to strive for that each day. Wonderful. So again, using that data in a purposeful, meaningful way so that it means something and you can start making an impact um, on the learners you have in front of you. Excellent. Thank you again to Laura, Thank Diane, you. and Mike. I truly appreciate you being here with us. Um, thank you to all of you in the field. You truly inspire uh, educational growth in your students every day. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. See you next time on Patent Pod. Thank <laughs> you.